guys, we're going to start reading Dealing with Dragons again. When we left off, Simmerin had just entered the door to the hovel, and we're going to pick up at Chapter 2. Let's see. Chapter 2, in which Simmerin discovers the value of a classical education and has some unwelcome visitors. Inside the hovel was dark and cool and damp. Simmerine found it a pleasant relief after the hot and dusty road, but she wondered why no sunlight seemed to come through the cracks in the boards. She was standing just inside the door, waiting for her eyes to adjust to the dark, when someone said crossly, Is this that princess we've been waiting for? Why don't you ask her? a deep and rumbly voice said. I'm Princess Simmerine of Linderwall, Simmerine answered politely. I was told you could help me. Help her, the first voice said, and Cimmerin heard a snort. I think we should just eat her and be done with it. Cimmerin began to feel frightened. She wondered whether the voices belonged to ogres or trolls, and whether she could slip out of the hovel before they made up their minds about eating her. She felt behind her for the door and started in surprise when her fingers touched damp stone instead of dry wood. Then a third voice said, not so fast, Warag. Let's hear her story first. So Simmerine took a deep breath and began to explain about the fencing lessons and the magic lessons and the Latin and the juggling and all the other things that weren't considered proper behavior for a princess. She told the voices that she had run away from Safen by the mountains to keep from having to marry Prince Berendale. And what do you expect us to do about it? One of the voices asked curiously. I don't know, Simmerine said, except of course that I would rather not be eaten. I can't see who you are in this dark, you know. That can be fixed, said the voice, and a moment later, a small ball of light appeared in the air above Simmerine's head, and Simmerine stepped backward very quickly and ran into the wall. The voices belonged to dragons. There were five of them, laying on or sprawled over or curled around the various rocks and columns that filled the huge cave where Simmerine now stood. Each of the males, there were three, had two short, stubby-looking, sharp horns on either side of their heads. The female dragon had three, one on each side and one in the center of her forehead. The last dragon, who was apparently still too young to have made up its mind about which sex it wanted to be, didn't have any horns at all. And Cimmerine felt very frightened. The smallest of the dragons was easily three times as tall as she was and they gave an overwhelming impression of shining green scales and sharp silver teeth. There were much, they were much scarier in person than in the pictures that she remembered from her natural history books. She swallowed very hard and wondered whether she really would rather be eaten by a dragon than Mary Farendale. Well, said the three-horned dragon just in front of her, just what are you asking us to do for you? I... Simmerine stopped short as an idea occurred to her. Cautiously, she asked, dragons are, are very fond of princesses, aren't they? Very, the dragon said and smiled. The smile showed all of her teeth, which Simmerine did not find reassuring. That is, I've heard of dragons who have captive princesses to cook for them and, and so on, Simmerine said, who had very little idea what captive princesses did all day. The dragon in front of Simmerine nodded, and one of the others, a yellowish-green color, shifted restlessly and said, Oh, let's just go ahead and eat her. It'll save trouble. Before any of the other dragons could answer, there was a loud, booming noise, and a sixth dragon slithered into the cave. His scales were more gray than green, and the other dragons by the door made way for him respectively. Kazool, the newcomer said in a loud voice, I'm sorry I'm late. A terrible thing happened on the way here. <laughs> what was it? said the dragon, to whom Simmerine had been talking. Ran into a wizard. <laughs> had to eat him. No help for it. <laughs> and now look at me. Every time the green-gray dragon sneezed, he emitted a small ball of fire that scorched the wall of the cave. Calm down, Roxon, said Kazool. You're only making it worse. <laughs> Calm down when I'm having an allergy attack. <laughs> Oh, bother! The small, the gray-green dragon said, Somebody give me a handkerchief! Here, said Simmerine, holding out one of the ones she had brought with her. Use this, 
she was beginning to feel much less frightened, for the gray green dragon reminded her of her great uncle, who was old and rather hard of hearing, and of whom she was rather fond. What's that? said Roxham. <laughs> oh, hurry up and give it here. Kazool took the handkerchief from Cimmerine, using two claws very delicately, and passed it to Roxham. The gray green dragon mopped his streaming eyes and blew his nose. That's better, I think. <laughs> oh, drat. The ball of fire that had accompanied the dragon's sneeze had reduced the handkerchief to a charred scrap. Cimmerine hastily dug out another one and handed it to Kazool, feeling very glad that she had brought several spares. Roxham went through two more handkerchiefs before his sneezing spasms finally stopped. Much better, he said. Now then, what's, uh, who's this that lent me the handkerchiefs? Somebody's new princess, eh? We were just discussing that when you came in, Kazool said, and she turned back to Cimmerine. You were saying about cooking and so on? Couldn't I do that for one of you for a while, Cimmerine said. The dragon smiled again, and Cimmerine swallowed hard. Possibly, but why would you want to do that? Because then I wouldn't have to go home and marry Farindale, Cimmerine said. Being a dragon's princess is a perfectly respectable thing to do, so my parents couldn't complain. It would be so much more interesting than embroidery and dancing lessons. Several of the dragons made snorting or choking noises. Cimmerine jumped up and then decided that they were laughing. This is ridiculous, the large, bright green dragon on Cimmerine's left said. Why? asked Kazool. A princess volunteering out of the question. That's easy for you to say, one of the other dragons grumbled. You already have a princess. What about the rest of us? Don't be so stuffy, Warag, said another. Besides, what else can we do with her? Eat her, suggested the yellowish-green dragon. No proper princess would come here looking for dragons, Warag objected. Well, I'm not a proper princess then, Cimmerine snapped. I make cherries jubilee, and I volunteer for dragons, and I conjugate Latin verbs, or at least I could if anyone would let me, so there. Here, here, said the gray-green dragon. You see, Warag said, who would want an improper princess? I would, said Kazool. You can't be serious, Kazool, Warag said irritably. Why? I like Cherry's Jubilee, Kazool replied, still watching Cimmerine, and I like the look of her. Besides, the Latin scrolls in my library need conjugating, and if I can't find someone who's a little of the language, I'll have to do it myself. Give her a trial run first, the purplish green dragon advised. Warag snorted, Latin and Cherry's Jubilee. Ugh. And, you, and for that, you'd take on a black-haired, snippy little, I'll thank you to be polite when you're discussing my princess. Kazil said, and smiled fiercely. Nice little gal, Roxon said, nodding approvingly and waving Cimmerine's next-to-last handkerchief. Got good sense. Be good for you, Kazool. If that's settled, I'm going to go find a snack, said the yellowish-green dragon. Warag looked around, but the other dragon seemed to agree with Roxon. Oh, very well, Warag said grumpily. It's your choice, after all, Kazool. It certainly is. Now, princess, if you'll come this way, I'll get you settled in. Cimmerine followed Kazool across the cave and down a tunnel. To her relief, the ball of light came with her, and she had an unfortunate feeling that if she tried to walk behind Kazool in the dark, she would have stepped on her tail, which would not have been a good beginning. Kazool led Cimmerine through a long maze of tunnels and finally stopped in another cave. Here we are, the dragon said. You can use the small room over on the right. I believe my last princess left most of the furnishings behind when she ran off with the knight. Thank you, said Cimmerine. When do I start my duties, and what are they, please? You start right away, said Kazool. I want dinner at seven. In the meantime, you can begin sorting my treasure. The dragon nodded to the dark opening on the left. I'm sure some of it needs repairing. There's at least one suit of armor with the leg off, and a couple of cheaper magic swords that are probably getting rusty. The rest of it really ought to get rearranged sensibly. I can never find anything when I want it. What about the library you mentioned? Cimmerine asked. We'll see how well you do on the treasure room first, Kazool said. The rest of your job I'll explain as we go along. You don't object to learning a little magic, do you? Not at all, said Cimmerine. Good, it'll make things much easier. Go and wash up. I'll let you into the treasure room as soon as you get started. Cimmerine nodded and went to the room Kazool had told her to use. As she washed her face and hands, she felt happier than she had in a long time. She was not going to have to marry, 
Arendelle. And sorting a, dra a dragon's treasure sounded far more interesting than dancing or embroidery. She was even going to learn some magic. And her parents wouldn't worry about her once they found out where she was. For the first time in her life, Simmerine was glad she was a princess. She dried her hands and turned to go back into the main cave, wondering how best to persuade Kazul to help her brush up on her Latin. She didn't want the dragon to be disappointed in her skill. Draco? Draconin? Dracone? she muttered through her lips with a curved smile. She had always been rather good at declining nouns. Still smiling, she started forward to begin her new duties. Simmerine settled in quickly. She got along well with Kazul and learned her way around the caves with minimum of mishaps. Actually, the caves were like an intricate web of tunnels, connecting caverns of various shapes and sizes that belonged to individual dragons. It reminded Simmerine of an underground city with tunnels instead of streets. She had no idea how far the tunnels extended, though she rather suspected some of them might have been magicked, so that when you walked down into them, you went a lot further than you thought you were going. Kazool's section of the caves was fairly large. In addition to the kitchen, which was a large cave near the exit, so there wouldn't be a problem from the smoke from the fire, she had a sleeping cavern, three enormous treasure rooms at the far end of an intricate maze of twisty little passages, two even more enormous storage rooms for the less valuable items, a library, a large bear cave for eating and visiting with other dragons, and the set of rooms that had been assigned to Simmerine. All the caves smelled of dragon, a somewhat musty, smoky, cinnamony smell, and Simmerine's first job was to air them out. Simmerine's rooms consisted of three small connecting caves just off Kazool's living cavern. They were furnished very comfortably in a mixture of styles and periods that looked like the guest rooms in most of the castle that Simmerine's had that Simmerine had visited. Without windows, they were too small for a dragon to get inside. When asked, Kazool said that the dwarves had made them in return for a favor, and the dragon's tone prevented Simmerine from inquiring too closely into what sort of favor it had been. By the end of the week, Simmerine was sure that enough of her was sure enough of her position to give Kazool a list of things that she needed in the kitchen. The previous princess, of whom Simmerine was beginning to have a very poor opinion, had apparently made do with a large skillet with three dents and a wobbly handle a wooden mixing bowl with a crack in it, and a badly tarnished copper tea kettle, as well as an assortment of mixed, mismatched plates, cups, and silverware, most of them chipped or bent. Kazool seemed pleased by the request, and the following day, Simmerine had everything she asked for, except for a few of the more exotic pans and dishes. This made cooking considerably easier and gave Simmerine more time to spend studying Latin and sorting treasure. The treasure was just as disorganized as Kazool had told her, and putting it in order was a major task. Sometimes it was hard to tell whether a ring was enchanted, and Simmerine knew better than to put it on and see. It might have been the sort of useful magic ring that turned you invisible, but it also might have been the sort of ring that turned you into a frog. Simmerine did the best she could to keep the pile of things in the corner, to keep a pile of things in the corner for those that she was not sure about. There was a great deal of treasure to be sorted. Most of it was stacked in one of the innermost caves, in a large, untidy heap of crowns, rings, jewels, swords, and coins. But Simmerine kept finding other things in this place as well, some of them quite unlikely. There was a small helmet under her bed, along with a great deal of dust, a silver bracelet set with opals on a reading table in the library, two daggers and a jeweled ink pot above the kitchen stove. Simmerine collected them all and along with the other things that were simply lying around the halls, put them back in the storerooms where they belonged, thinking to herself that dragons were clearly not very tidy creatures. The first of the nights arrived at the end of the second week. Simmerine was busy cleaning swords, and Kazool had been right about their condition. Not only were some of them rusty, nearly all of them needed sharpening. She was polishing the last flakes of rust from an enormous broadsword when she heard someone calling from the mouth of the cave. Feeling somewhat irritated by the interruption, she rose, carrying the sword, and went to see who it was. When she came nearer to the entrance, she was able to make out the words that whoever it was was shouting, Dragon! Come out and fight! Fight for Princess Simmerine of Linderwall! 
Oh, honestly, Simmering muttered and quickly stepped over. Hear you, she came as she shouted out into the sunlight and then had to duck as a spear flashed through the air over her head. Stop that, she cried. I'm Princess Simmering. You are, said a doubtful voice. Are you sure? I mean, Simmerin raised her head cautiously and squinted. It was still fairly early in the morning, and the sun was in the back of the person standing outside the cave, so it was difficult to see anything but an outline of his figure against the brightness. Of course I'm sure, Simmerin said. What did you expect? Letters of reference? Come around here so I can see who you are, please. The figure moved sideways, and Simmerin saw that the knight was in shiny new armor, except for the legs where his armor was dusty from walking. Cimmerine wondered briefly why he hadn't ridden, but decided not to ask. The knight's visor was raised, and a few wisps of sandy hair showed above his handsome face. He was studying her with an expression of worried puzzlement. What can I do for you? Cimmerine said, after several moments had gone by, and the knight still hadn't said anything. Well, um, if you are Princess Cimmerine, I've come to rescue you from the dragon, the knight said. Cimmerine set the point of her broadsword on the ground and leaned against it as if it were a walking cane. I thought that might be it, she said, but I'd rather not be rescued. Thank you just the same. Not be rescued? The knight's puzzled look deepened. But princesses always... No, they don't, Cimmerine said firmly, recognizing the beginning of a familiar argument. And even if I wanted to be rescued, you're going about it all wrong. What? The knight said, thoroughly taken back shouting come out and fight the way you did no self-respecting dragon is going to answer a challenge like that it sounds like a child's dare dragons are very conscious of their dignity at least all the ones i've met so far are oh the knight said sounding very crestfallen what should i have said stand forth and do battle is the usual challenge Simmerine said with authority, remembering her princess lessons. She'd always been more interested in what knights and dragons were supposed to say than memorizing the places she was supposed to scream. But the wording doesn't have to be exact, as long as it's suitably formal. You're new at this, aren't you? Rescuing you is going to be my first big quest, the knight said gloomily. Are you sure you don't want to be rescued? Quite sure, said Simmerine. I like living with Kazool. You like? The knight stared at her for a moment. His expression cleared and said, Of course the dragons enchanted you. I should have thought of that before. Kazool has not enchanted me, and I do not want to be rescued by anybody, Simmerine said, alarmed by the knight's sudden enthusiasm. This place suits me very well. I like polishing swords and cooking cherries jubilee and reading Latin scrolls. And if you don't believe me, ask anyone in Linderwall. They've been complaining about my unprincess-like behavior for years. I did hear something about fencing lessons, the knight said doubtfully. But knights aren't supposed to pay attention to that kind of thing. We're supposed to be above the rumors and gossip. The fencing lessons were just the beginning, Simmerine assured him. So you see why I'm perfectly happy being a dragon's princess. Um, yes, said the knight, but he didn't look convinced. Speaking of dragons, where's yours? Kazool is not my dragon, Simmerine said sharply. I'm her princess. You'll never have any luck dealing with dragons if you can't get these things straight. And she's gone to the enchanted forest on the other side of the mountains to borrow a crepe pan from a witch she knows. She what? said the knight. She's gone to borrow a crepe pan. Simmerine repeated in a louder voice. Perhaps you better have your helmet checked when you get back. They're not supposed to interfere with your hearing, but sometimes... Oh, I heard you, the knight said. But what does a dragon want with a crepe pan? She doesn't want it. I do. I found a recipe in the library I want to try, but the kitchen just isn't equipped to handle anything but the most ordinary cooking. Kazua will fix that eventually, but for the time being, we're going to have to borrow things like crepe pans and souffle dishes. You really do like it here, the knight said wonderingly. Simmerine refrained from replying that this was what she had been trying to tell him all along and instead said, how did you know where I was? Things get around, the knight waved a hand in a vague manner. In fact, I had to hurry to make sure I was the first half of the kingdom of Linderwall. 
and a princess's hand in marriage is a rich reward, enough to tempt a lot of people who wouldn't normally bother with this sort of thing. Father has offered half the kingdom to anyone who rescues me, Cimmerine said incredulously. That's more than all my sister's dowries put together. It's the usual thing in cases like this, the knight said mildly. It would be, Cimmerine said in tones of deep disgust. Ugh, well, at least you can go back and tell them I don't want to be rescued, and that will keep anyone else from coming up here to get me. I can't do that, said the knight. It's just not done, Cimmerine finished. I understand perfectly. She gave him a polite farewell, and more because she had more because she'd been brought up well than because she felt like being polite, and sent him on his way. Then she went back into the cave and polished the broadsword until it was mirror bright, which relieved her feelings a little bit. There were two more nights the following day, and four more the day after that. On the fourth day there was only one, but he was especially stubborn. And it took Simmery nearly two hours to get rid of him. By then she was thoroughly disgusted, and even considering letting Pizul handle the nights from now on. But she couldn't quite bring herself to do it. The knights would certainly attack Azul as soon as they saw her. And since that was what they were coming for, sooner or later, someone would get hurt. Cimmerine did not like to think that someone might be trying, someone might be hurt trying to rescue her, particularly since she didn't want to be rescued. So with a sigh, she decided that she would continue to handle the knights as long as Kazool would let her. Prince Therondil showed up on the end of the third week. He was limping a little, as if his metal boots pinched his toes, and the feathers attached to the top of his helmet sagged badly. He stopped and carefully struck an impressive pose before issuing the usual challenge. Cimmerine was not in the mood to be impressed. Besides, she could see that his helmet was a different style from his gold armor, and that the armor had gapes at the knees and the elbows where it didn't fit together quite right. "'Aren't you a little slow?' she asked irritably. "'There have been eight nights before you.' Eight, the prince said, frowning. I thought by now there had been at least twelve. Perhaps I'd better come back later. Cimmerine stared at him in surprise. Why? Well, it would look better, Therondale explained seriously. There's not much glory in defeating a dragon that hasn't already beaten ten or fifteen people at least. So a Gorlax of Mistworld wouldn't even consider going after a dragon whose score was less than forty-five. But I don't want to risk waiting that long. But eight just doesn't seem like enough. You're going to go away and wait until Kazool has defeated 15 knights before you come back to rescue me, Cimmerine said. She found Therondale's smug confidence very annoying, but she didn't like to say so out loud. Not if you'd rather be rescued now, of course, Therondale said hastily, though you ought to consider the advantages. I expect it won't be so very long. His voice trailed off, and he looked at her hopefully. I'm afraid it will be a very long time, Cimmerine said with satisfaction. You see, Kazool hasn't defeated any knights at all yet. But, 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 but I thought you said there'd been eight, Therondale sputtered. I said eight of them had come by. I didn't say they'd fought anyone. You see, I sent them away. You sent them away, Therondale repeated, plainly horrified. But that's, that's not done. I know, Cimmerine smiled sweetly, but I've done it, and I intend to go on doing it, so you might as well go home and warn your friends. They'd feel foolish, you know, if they came all this way to the mountains to rescue me, and then they had to turn around and go back home without doing anything. They certainly would, Therondale said indignantly. What do you mean by playing these kinds of tricks? Don't you want to be rescued? No, Cimmerine said, losing her patience at last. I don't. I'm tired of having my work constantly interrupted, so please go away and don't come back. You can't possibly mean that, Therondale said. Besides, everyone expects me to rescue you. That's your problem, Cimmerine told him. I'm going to fix dinner. Goodbye. And before he could say anything, she turned and ducked back into the cave, hoping the prince wouldn't follow. That's the end of chapter two. Next time we'll pick up with chapter three in which Cimmerine meets a witch and has doubts about a wizard. I hope you guys are enjoying the story so far. I know I am loving reading it over again. Until I see you next, I hope you stay happy and safe. Goodbye, guys.